Welcome back to the EXP podcast. We have a, a great episode lined up. We're going to be talking about some kind of general career related topics today. Um, I've got Luan back with me once again to help host. Hello. And we are joined by Dylan and Charlie. So if you guys want to introduce yourselves, Dylan, do you want to start us off? Sure. Hello, everyone. Yeah, my name is Dylan Abernathy. I'm a senior 3D environment artist. I'm currently working at Compulsion Games. I guess a little bit about my background. I started off at Ubisoft. Um, from there, I ended up going to the Coalition for a little bit as a, a contract worker on Gears 5 and some unannounced stuff. Now I'm at Compulsion, as I mentioned, and I've also been helping out ArtStation with some of their learning courses recently. So it's a pleasure to be here and, and chat with everyone. Awesome. And Charlie? Hi, y'all. I'm Charlie Foreman. I'm currently a material artist at People Can Fly uh, on an unannounced project. And before that, I started at Naughty Dog. I was a contractor on Last of Us 2. And then I went over to Sony Visual Arts, where I got to work with Insomniac on Spider-Man Remastered and Spider-Man 2 when that got announced. Uh, and yeah, I've been in the industry about three-ish years now. So it's fun that I get to talk with y'all today about some stuff I'm pretty passionate about. So yeah, that's all I got for my intro. Good stuff. Yeah. Thank you both for joining us today. We have like a few kind of different topics about career stuff we wanted to touch on, but I guess it's probably a good place to start at the beginning and look at some um, kind of student-based advice. So both of you guys have, and you've got a few years under your belt now in the in the industry, but thinking back to kind of when you were, were students or getting in, is there any kind of things that you look back on or reflect and think, oh, these were, uh, these were things that were tripping me up or or things that you, you maybe you see in other students that are kind of mistakes or things that are holding them back a bit. I guess general advice for those at the start of their career, perhaps. Yeah, I know Charlie and I had pretty different college experiences. Um, I can speak on mine pretty briefly, but I, because, uh, well, I, I, I haven't been out of school too, too long. I guess my graduation year was actually 2019. So three years for me in the industry as well. But um, for me, I think my biggest probably downfall or regret was like I tried to consistently um, stay on top of like every single course so my, my program was very obtuse like we were doing concept art and animation and uh, all that kind of stuff right up into the end even when we were working on our portfolios for our, our final sort of like graduation reels and stuff like that and I would have just I don't know I, it's definitely important to learn those things like I'm glad I have the fundamental knowledge of uh, you know illustration especially animation like that pops up every once in a while with keyframes and stuff. But I just put too much time into that that took away from the stuff that actually I knew I was interested in because I knew I wanted to do environment art pretty early on. So maybe spending less time on the things that I knew I wasn't super interested in and just sort of funneling that time into the areas that I actually wanted to focus on because there was just there was just too much near the end. Like you'd be working on your demo reels and there's like, oh, do another walk cycle for the 50th time. And I'm like, I don't come on. <laughs> I don't need that. So yeah, maybe just, just really learning what it is that you want to do and, and channeling into it near the end. But at the start, like, make sure you, you understand everything. Like that's kind of like a, once you have that figured out kind of mentality, I think, but definitely could have, could have adjusted my time better to get more sleep. Was there any of the subjects that you wish you kind of kept up with? Uh, well, like I said, like everything benefits you in certain ways. And like, I, I think I stayed on top of most things more than I should have maybe I would have looked into like cinematography a little bit more for like framing I think that's an important one and then um lighting was huge like that was something I, I think I should have invested a little bit more time into I was just mostly worried about like putting props together more than anything um but yeah there's always other stuff that I could have spent a little bit more time on I think cinematography is like a huge one that a lot of universities don't even kind of touch on that or like even look at any studies like even even for I guess like theoretical modules if you had any I know I had a few like it would have been cool if we looked at film or yeah like breakdowns of film and stuff because I think that's it's one of the things that's definitely helped elevate my art to look more into especially for the environment artist right like you kind of want to have mm -hmm. those foundations in cinematography I think it's something that a lot of people are lacking so it's just awesome to see like uh, more and more people embracing that. Yeah, we were really lucky. We had a professor who was um, working at Ubisoft and he, he was also our animation professor. 
So we would be given some scenes that were just sort of like Maya play blasts and the assignments would be like set up cameras for these um, different parts, like make the cuts on your own, like make sure you're framing the character running through this environment. And he's, he's always like visually appealing. And I think like learning that really helps for when you're framing a scene later on and sort of keeping things interesting for the viewer. So I, I really enjoyed that. I wish, um, yeah, I probably could have sunk my teeth into that a little bit more because eventually when you're making your own stuff, like you always have to be thinking about that. So that, that was super beneficial. We had to do something like that um, when I was in college, uh, we, but it was not like in Maya, it was more like engine focused. It was for like our tech class. It was basically just for like learning blueprint basics. Um, they kind of like overlap uh, pretty much. And it was like, I thought that was like the best general class that we took was like all our gate tech classes um, because they got the most direction and also the professor graded us the hardest. It was basically really shocking when we got to the midterm and it was basically, you need to recreate this shader. And then we basically, everyone had like two hours to do it. And it was like a very difficult one with like animation and like stuff like that. And almost like nobody passes. And that's like kind of the point. So I remember it was like way differently because it's like to give you like an idea of how you're supposed to like use like things you might not be as familiar with, but have learned in like specific instances and how they can like be reapplied. I think that was like something that kind of pushed me into material art because I didn't get into it after until after I graduated um, is kind of, Hey, like here's like a, you know, a tutorial of like how to do something or like a demo of how to do something. Uh, and substance designer, I always feel like you can like do the same thing, but apply it to like 10, 15 different materials. You know, like I use the same setup for some of my materials, like for both personal and professional work. Um, and then just managed to like tweak them just a little bit. Um, and it all like kind of goes back to like that instance, like in school being like, whoa, that's so cool. Like I learned something and now I can apply it to like 50 different things, you know? So, and it, and it, you know, it stretches even farther than art too. Cause it gives you like an idea of like layout and like stuff like that. Yeah. I think efficiency is, is definitely something I've noticed that a lot of students struggle to get their, their head around as well with making scenes. Like often they'll not just over scope, but then like uh, within that, try to make too much or like not reuse things in a clever way. Like you don't have to fill a scene with 10 unique vases. You can make two and then, you know, make a material instance with some color variation or something. And that sort of working in game dev teaches you that you can, you can really like, you can reuse stuff a lot more than you thought you could. Like people don't notice stuff is yeah. duplicated and changed very slightly. Like in game, like once you, you do know, like you, you, like I look at games now and playing through a game and I'm like, oh, this is just mirrored. Like, but every FromSoft game is recycled assets and that's not because they're lazy. It's because like, Hey, like these are, these just need like a little bit of polish and then, Hey, let's just put them in. They're perfectly good. No reason to just completely remake them from scratch. You know, they don't have the time for that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I spend a lot of time at work doing like kit bashing and stuff because we've got such a huge library of assets like what's the you know you don't need to make everything new um every time and i think that's that's definitely something early on that's harder to get your head around like what they don't just make everything every time like no no you can just take you know even if you've got a couple of assets that are not quite what you need you can just take that add a little bit or move something around clever reuse is, is really where it's at to save time just it's so easy to kind of look at like uh you know, guys like Tyler Smith and things who just seem to pump out environments all the time. It's like, wow, well, how does he make like 6,000 environments every day? Because he just pretty much reuses the same stuff in different compositions. Like if you're clever with how you do it, it's not super obvious what's what's reused and stuff. I think it depends as well, right? You've got the people who um, who will push for like, oh, modular kits, modular environments, uh, blah, blah, blah. But then there's also the people that just want to make the one, the one shot, the one piece. Um and they just know exactly how to hit, um, you know, the assets quickly and, and fast without having to, to like reuse a kit or anything like that. But then let's say you built that little library of uh, materials and then can take that and make something else with it that's completely different, right? So, um, yeah, it depends on what kind of artist you are, I think. Um, it's, it's awesome to have the knowledge to be as efficient as possible. But uh, um, at the same time, if you're just wanting to just make a shot for your per project i think that's that's sort of okay to to not be overly efficient i guess 
but it depends, I guess, what you're after showing, uh, especially as a junior, it's kind of important to show that kind of knowledge, right? So yeah, I find like when you're in a studio, or at least for me, like it kind of opened my mind a little bit to like, oh, wow, everything here is, it's reusing stuff. While when I was in school, I was that guy who literally everything was unique, everything had a unique texture. Don't don't be that guy. But it's so much different when you have like a full library of stuff to work with versus what you just have on your hard drive. And I think it's a little bit different today with mega scans and stuff like that. I wonder if students now are a bit more conflicted about that or if that's actually a good thing for them. Um, but yeah, I think at school, the art side is obviously very important, but I would probably say the most important thing is getting the discipline, sort of like learning what you're good at and what you're not good at, what you want. I think it's more like the soft stuff and then the actual hard skills will come with time and practice. Because I kind of have like a love-hate relationship with the idea of schooling for this stuff. I think like game art is such a specific topic that like a traditional school isn't necessarily the best way to learn it. But it's really, really good for these sort of soft skills because you're in an environment with a lot of like-minded people in a structure. So I would make the most of, of that more than the actual hard skills because that will come with time if you keep practicing and, and stay in the community. That's exactly how I feel. Like, I adored my time at university. Um, sorry if you hear a beep. It seems like my dishwasher's done. I adored my time at university. It was so, so good. Um, but not because I was learning specifically game art. It's because I was just learning all of the soft skills to sort of push myself forward and just, like, working with other people around me to, to understand, like, teamwork and, you know, I think those are the things that university gave me that if I was learning alone, I absolutely would not have because I'm very bad at learning alone. Um, but um, yeah, it depends, I think, what people are after with university. I think um, for me, it was very much about learning these soft skills and, and, and not, I mean, of course, the, the game art part as well. But um, anything that I wanted to push further in terms of, uh, you know, modeling or lighting or materials or whatever, whatever the hell else at the time, I very much did it on my own time whilst using the university as a structure to help me push it even further, you know, so it was nice. Yeah, like that's that's one thing I picked up on in first year was like, I'd want to start learning something like, oh, how do you use Substance Designer or ZBrush? And then you look at the curriculum and you're like, oh, that's second year semester two. But you can, you can just look it up on YouTube and start learning immediately, right? So like if you want to get something, if you if you're just seeking like the actual knowledge of how do I execute this or use this program like you can find that information anywhere and most of the time it's for free but like you said and i can relate to it and most people i've talked to it's like having that structure there to make sure you're getting up every day and you're learning something and you're like active in the community is what what you're actually getting the most bang for your buck for the difference um with like schools and like versus like learning on your own is this industry changes like super super quickly when i was in school we didn't even have like, because I graduated in 2018, so just a little like before uh, you, Dylan. So like they didn't even have like a substance designer course. We had like a materials textures course, but it was pretty much like predominantly like in like Arnold. And basically like right when I was like at the end of my senior year and I went to like my first GDC, I went to Daniel Tiger's talk where he revealed like the first signature series. So this is like right, like I think when like substance content was like starting to take off because there were like. I remember like scouring YouTube. There were like almost no good substance designer tutorials. There were like, there were like two good channels that I I was like could find any like tutorial that actually explained like what the program was about besides like a like rhythmics like actual uh, channel. And that's like kind of when I realized like you kind of do just like you, a school can teach you so much, but like there's going to be new programs. Programs are going to get updates. Workflows are going to change. Pipelines are going to change. Like now every studio is using. Uh, like Unreal, like it's an exaggeration, but they had that. I remember they had that giant like post uh, when Unreal Five came out. It's like these are all the studios using this program now. You know, it's almost like phased out a lot of engines. Um, so now, like you know, I don't really like think school is like to blame. You know, for that like exactly. So it's it is like more like would you say where it just kind of does like fall into the students like responsibility to like learn and conversely like compared to you i didn't do that uh, at school so that's why i spent a year like after i graduated uh playing catch up um but there were so many communities and there still are like xp is one dnc is another and that was how we met because i remember mm -hmm. seeing 
your YouTube videos. <laughs> uh, and then I saw you in Dynasty and I sent you a message and that was like the end of that. <laughs> so Yeah, here we are three years later. <laughs> actually, it's technically four because yeah. you were still in school. So, but like, yeah, like that's like what I mean. Like it's, ba- it's kind of, it kind of is like um, online communities are basically schools that you don't pay for that have even more like-minded people and usually more people like in the industry. But the school I went to uh, had a very good like alumni like network essentially. So that was like the main thing I got besides making a lot of friends that I adore more than I think even the soft skills that I got there because I ended up switching disciplines after I graduated anyway and self-teaching myself. My my school here that I went to, um, there's one thing it taught me that I'm really, really grateful for. Um, not that I didn't have it before, but it's something that I really made, helped like push me. And that is just like, being creative with my work like at the time that i was graduating the schools here were basically split into there there weren't a lot right uh, i was like 20 2015 i think um and um you either had a university that taught you how to make ak-47s and abandoned corridors and every student coming out of it had exactly that or you had schools like mine which weren't going hardcore on on the game art side like skill skill wise like we had the tutors and everything but it was like it wasn't like you were sitting there just learning modeling, but they really pushed the creativity side. Like I would present a project and there was just a lot of talk about like what that project meant to me, like what I was trying to do with it, what I was trying to say about it. And I think that shaped me, to be honest, as an artist, because whenever I work on a project, a personal project, that is, I try to get a lot of meaning out of it rather than just do like a like an exercise on modeling or this or that. And I think that, that there were like two schools, schools of thought, no pun intended at the time and uh i'm very grateful that mine sort of pushed me more towards creativity because like now i learned all the all the technical and hard skills after the fact i also have this sort of extra creativity that i think school push pushed me towards that i'm very grateful for and i, I don't know if you guys feel like school p- pushes with that a lot or helps with that a lot but i think it was something very nice that that mine did um <laughs> I mean, I think my school, I don't know. I, I, I'm i trying to think of how to word this. I just think mine was like too much all at once. Like they, they were always pushing like more and more and more. So at a certain point, I was just like, oh, I just want to get stuff done. Because I think each semester we had like nine classes or something. And there was always assignments doing everything like every week. So at a certain point, you're just like, I just need to get this shit done. That just sounds overwhelming. That is a ridiculous number of classes. We had like three. Yeah, it was way too much, way too much. You'd have like several classes a day that were several hours long. And by the end of it, you're just like, oh my God. Having like a ton of creativity in there, there were certain things where it was leaning into your discipline and you're like, I, I really want to do this. But some things you were just like, I just want to get this done. But it, it was nice that at the very end, um, the whole final year was very much like just make three portfolio pieces and you kind of were able to push that in whatever direction you wanted to. That I think for me is where I can relate to what you were saying. And I found that really nice because one of the things that you have to realize is like you're gonna do your best and put your most effort into the things that you want to and as soon as we were sort of given that freedom you could tell a lot of the students started to shine um because they were really just sort of having fun with it and I, i think that's a huge part of it like if you are able to have fun with it and sort of cater it in the direction that you want to you're always going to be doing better so i once again looping back to a point i made earlier it's like focus on the stuff that you want to do the most and then the other stuff can sort of help aid that but you should probably prioritize things a little bit because things can get so obtuse so quickly with like even just being an environment artist it's like you need to know modeling modular stuff uh, materials lighting composition like it it gets so much but it's like if you can find what it is you really enjoy that that's always going to help a ton it's hard generally like there is a lot and I, i think a lot of students that i've talked to kind of go in and they They don't really know anything about how the careers are structured within games. So they kind of go in with this general idea of I like art and I like games, Um, which pretty similar to to sort of my own experience. And then you kind of have those three, you know, three, four, whatever long the course is, years to to kind of figure out the specifics of what you want to do. And like, obviously, if you knew exactly what you wanted to do going into it, like buying courses online or something would be a much faster way to, to get to career ready. But I think that, the advantage that you that of the diversity of the things you kind of learn in the university course is that you you touch on a lot of things and it gives you more of a chance to understand what you do and you don't like in a yeah, in a way that's not so it's it's almost like there's less 
there's kind of less consequence for failing or, or more of a cushion. Like if you like if you thought, oh, I really want to be a character artist and you, you know, you bought all these tutorials, you invest all this time and you didn't, you know, you didn't get on with it. Um, I think that could be really, really kind of like devastatingly hard. Whereas if it's one module at university and, you know, you don't get on with it, it's it's a bit less important. Like each each module, well, I guess if you've got nine, then. <laughs> I don't know. I, I totally get that. I actually, before all of this, I wanted to be a, a character artist. That's sort of what got me into it for the most part. Like I, long story short, the reason I got into 3D was like graphic design. Eventually realized, oh wait, this is one step removed from video games. And I really liked character art. So I was buying all these character tutorials like Mark Brunet from Cube Brush and, and stuff like that, like picking up his stuff before I realized this is hard. And school gave me a lot of similar experiences to that, where you're you're trying out a bunch of things in a risk-free environment, and you're kind of learning like, ah, oh, this is what I don't like, this is what I like, and just failing fast. I think there's a ton of benefit to like doing things you don't want to do or are are uncomfortable with, just so you know it's like this is at least I know I don't like this, which has a ton of value in itself. Because a lot of people I find they come to the end of school and they're like, I still don't really know what it is that I, I want to do or what I land on. But at the very least, you have like 10 things you know you don't want to do, which even if you haven't settled yet, you're steering in the right direction, which there's there's a ton of value in that. I think school is basically just meant to be like, it's kind of strange because I think the misconception with school is pretty much that uh, when you're done with school, you're going to be employed. And uh, in my experience, that's only true, like, I'd say for 30% of people mm -hmm. that finish. <laughs> and that I think that's even being generous. School, like in like all the way through is like what Dylan said, the soft skills. And like, I feel like with how expensive like school is getting to, it's why more people are being vocal about just like learning online. I, I'm someone who does like say, like, I think you should still go to school. Like maybe not even if for game art, you could go for something else and you could just like learn it as like a hobbyist. Cause I think there's more and more hobbyists like getting in to the industry. Cause like now I'll see like a former electrician or like something uh, like on someone's art station, I saw. I remember. I don't remember his name, but I follow one guy who's like a who's like a paleontologist. I think and he's like a concept designer. It's such a flex, though. I, I follow this person. I think they're in Korea or something, and it's like their tag is like brain surgeon, and they have this like incredible concept art. And you're like, that's not fair, man. You can't be both of those. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But like, yeah, like school. I think the thing that school really doesn't like prepare people well for is like actually like networking and like presenting yourself and i actually do think that this is something that my school did pretty good it's like they it's like it preps you for like the career fairs and you have like a few like mock interviews um and there's a lot of like alumni that come back and give talks every month or every few like even like just for my just for like the game art major like every month or so there was like always like some someone that like would come and like the school would sponsor them or like they would come from like a, the club um, because there was like a game development like network club at my school, so you're getting like double, you know, the knowledge base. And I didn't even take advantage of that until my my senior year when I started like going to those because I always thought, you know, I can't go, my portfolio isn't there, so like, what am I going to gain? And then I realized, oh, I can meet people and hear about their experience. The only thing that my, that I thought that, and I still get messages from students uh, from my school who are like still there. They, they like send me their portfolio and it's on like Wix and I want to like scream. <laughs> I'm like, why is it on Wix? And they're like, well, the portfolio instructor said that our station is like Instagram and it's unprofessional. I'm like, well, it is like Instagram, but that doesn't make it unprofessional. Everyone uses it. <laughs> There's a reason. Uh, it's like, it's the craziest thing. We had the same thing. We had to make portfolios on like Weebly and Wix and like print out business cards. I'm like, when is this? Like, what what year is this, man? Hey, I've, I've used my business cards. I've actually used my cards that I printed. <laughs> See, I printed some. I think I maybe gave some away, but I don't think they went anywhere. Like, I think it makes more sense for you because you're you seem to have had many more social situations. For me, it's like we didn't have that, and I'm just trying to imagine a scenario where I like bump into someone on the street and hand them my card. I'm like, where is that going to go? But if you have like events lined up, yeah, okay, that's that's totally different. Granted, the rest of them are sitting under my desk right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still have some. I actually saw them the other day because I was, I was moving houses like a couple months ago and I was just going through a bunch of boxes like, oh my God, what's this? I opened it up as like my uh, my business cards from school. I was like, oh shit, this is they awesome. They do make you feel cool and professional. They make you feel awesome, especially if you printed it on nice paper and stuff. But it's funny, like we actually did our, um, well, we, a lot of people did their um 
portfolios and stuff on like Wix or whatever, but that's because like ArtStation was just starting out when we were in uni and we didn't really know any better. So I think uh, uh, a lot of people kind of didn't have as much reach with their portfolios and they tried to like try like to do fancy stuff like code their own like front ends and stuff. Yeah, that was a that was an experience. <laughs> Get it on ArtStation. Only tech artists are allowed to have their own really obscure website. That's, that's right. The, that's the rule. If you're a tech artist, you can have Banana Coffin 69 as your website, but otherwise, get on art station. <laughs> There's definitely this tricky element with a lot of universities where the lecturers have been out of industry for like 10 years in a lot of cases. And if they don't put active effort into keeping up with what are the norms, they end up kind of teaching this antiquated advice like, put your portfolio on this website I guess at least it's not burn it onto a dvd and post it to them it's kind of a tricky area for a lot of students i, I don't know if you saw the video Lauren, but i think someone shared it on exp the other week where there was um it was a video from a guy who was streaming talking about 3d and he, he was he was going on a rant about how there's a lot of he gets a lot of messages from like university lecturers sending their portfolio to him like asking for jobs and and they aren't good enough to like get a job like their work isn't good enough to get into the industry and how he was talking about how it's basically scamming students to pay. I mean, it's 9,000 pounds a year here in the UK. I don't know how it is in similar here in Canada. It's like you're getting taught by someone who themselves isn't actually of the level to be able to get a job in industry. It's obviously not the case everywhere, but I think this, this can happen and it's tricky and difficult, but I think the, the stuff you're saying about using university for those soft skills, I think that's probably the biggest takeaway. Like you can essentially, well, nowadays, I mean, it hasn't always been the case, but nowadays you can go online, you can go on ArtStation, Gumroad, whatever. You can buy a tutorial for 10, 20 bucks that'll teach you any industry technique you want. So in a way, I guess it's less important to necessarily need to have a lecturer who knows every technique, but it it is also, like Charlie was saying, like the idea that I think a lot of students go into university thinking I'm going to come out ready for a job. And that is not true 90% of the time. Like at my university, I knew a couple of people who really, really knew what they wanted. They really specialized and they got picked up for that. But I think most people, if you didn't, or if you come out at the end and you don't have that really, really focused portfolio of stuff, it's, it's difficult. Like you, it might take time to hit that bar. You know, it was surprising to me how many people had left my, my uni and gone straight into teaching the same subject and the cycle yeah i i really don't know how i feel about that because i like i had one tutor one or two tutors basically who were like fair, fairly good recent straight from um like sony and, and whatever and they were great but the majority of the others were very much art tutors um and it kind of like if you're not even at a junior level coming out of uni and you go back and you teach, I, I don't know, man, I'm not sure that's the best thing for, for the students. I, so like I throughout school have been like posting tutorials on YouTube and stuff, but kind of knowing that I, I especially at that time, like didn't really know a ton, but it, I was putting it out there for free. So there's really no cost to enrollment. I, I don't know if I would feel comfortable diving immediately into teaching a class or something like that when there's that much money involved. But um, to the professor's defense a little bit, like I completely agree. There, there are far too many professors um, that are maybe a little bit too out of the loop um, just because of their, their experience. It's been a while since they've been in the industry. But I, I've also had the chance to talk to some professors and just the, the actual structure of most colleges and universities, like for them to, for example, like redo a curriculum and add in a new program and go through the hoops of having that, it can take years sometimes to like update a course or get the approval to get new licenses for something. Like that's why I, I always say like, I don't think the structure is really the best for teaching this kind of stuff, like the actual hard skills. Because yeah, it, it can sometimes just take ages for them to even get something to be updated. And then by the time that it's updated, it's already out of date again, just because of how fast everything's sort of flipping all over the place i mean let alone like just going through every like whatever 100 students that you have just on this one year and and like evaluating their their work at the end of a semester right like that alone takes mm -hmm. up months and then on top of that you have to keep the cur curriculum up to date and like make up new classes etc like it's hard work it's definitely yeah hard work. yeah it's a lot i certainly have an appreciation for some of the online schools that are circumventing that 
in that they, because they're not offering a proper degree, they don't have to stick to this accredited structure. It allows them to be a bit faster and loose and they can bring in, like I know there are some online schools and stuff that will just bring in some some lecturers for like guest lecturers for like, you know, maybe an hour, two hours a week with the students. And and you can bring in someone who's actually in industry then, right? Because mm-hmm. you just pay them for a couple of hours in the evening, once a week or something, or, you know, a couple of times a month or whatever. And you've got someone who's who knows their stuff to give like a little workshop or a masterclass or a, a talk on something. The, the tricky thing is that for a lot of people, the, the degree is, is still necessary because it's tied to a lot of visa and immigration things. If you come from a country where you don't necessarily have the biggest amount of industry, it's going to be important to get a degree because otherwise you're not going to, you're going to have no chance of being able to get a work abroad. It's funny. I've got a friend who's uh, currently going to Canada and he's got plenty of experience in the industry. He's, he's fine on that end, uh, but he's failed like a visa because of, uh, because of education. So it's like, it's annoying how the, how tied to that process and completely irrelevant it is at the same time. Even more important now with the advent of remote work. That's right. People are like want to move to different countries. I work with a lot of people right now who are like living in different countries. Some of them from America, you know, some of them in Europe, some of them moving to Canada, you know, so and they have to like wait, you know, for uh, work to sponsor them a visa or they were already there. But even like now like with people like wanting to be more flexible like you know i was just in british columbia last week and now it's like oh i want to move there (laughs) (laughs) but that's all tied to work and you know degrees like stuff like that Uh, and like there's plenty of certification programs in america too that people have done i know full sail was one for a long time and i met people that uh took that like years ago so instead but now i think that's like a full like program because you touched on kind of remote because uh I think that's a good topic to to move on to talking about the the rise of remote work. So I'm sure many of our listeners will be aware that there was a pandemic for the last couple of years. When was this? They might have heard about it. I, uh, I did not know. I obviously did it. I, 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 I was at why. home this whole time. I didn't really realize it. Yeah, me too. I was in my, I was at home. <laughs> I mean, for us, nothing really changed, right? They were like, don't go outside. And you're like, people go outside. Yeah, I'm good at that already. <laughs> But I think that COVID has sort of forced the hand of a lot of companies to show that it is possible for people to work remotely. And it hasn't been friction free. We've seen quite a lot of games get delayed and things. But I think in general, it's been pretty positive and a lot of companies have embraced the idea. Whereas previously they were thinking everyone needs to be in house. A lot of a lot of studios and things are looking at, you know, hybrid, remote, mixed just sort of allowing people to work wherever is best for them. And I think this is definitely bringing rise to more opportunities generally. I know there is still a bit of a tricky concern with things like hiring abroad and how that affects things like tax. So I know for smaller studios and things that even if they're happy for remote, they're still not able to hire people out of the country. Even big studios. It's a bit of a tough one, that one. It's a bit easier for, you know, really big groups like Microsoft and Sony, if you have lots of studios spread across the country, because you can kind of, or different countries, you can kind of uh, piggyback on the back of some others, kind of like Kem's been doing, being able to move to Canada and still still work for a UK studio. And that's definitely a massive perk, I feel, in both ends. It's allowing studios to be able to hire talent that perhaps they wouldn't otherwise be able to get because the person doesn't want to move to that area or or be there. And also it's a a benefit for those of us who do prefer the remote work who can, um, it's easier to get hold of work if you, or, and, and it's easier to move work as well, right? Like if you're not necessarily tied by location, you can actually move job. What have your guys kind of experience been with that, with the kind of remote in-house? How did you get on during the pandemic and, yeah, what are your thoughts about about it? I kind of feel a little guilty about it because it actually ended up being a pretty big benefit to my career overall. When the the pandemic started, like in, and honestly, since then there's been a lot of open opportunities within the industry, especially on the art side. Um, and I I ended up switching studios to the coalition with the intention of I was going to move to Vancouver. Like I was in Toronto at the time, and um, 
I was working remotely for them. It was it was really great. I had a friend recommend me. It uh, sort of helped my career along a lot because the position was senior. It was my first senior position, so that was a a really good opportunity for me to to look into that. And I loved the work there. The, the team was amazing. But what ended up happening was I never actually had to move down there because this whole pandemic thing lasted way longer than we expected. And my my position there was contract, so it was only a year and a half. So at a certain point, my lead was just kind of like, hey, man, you don't really have to move down here anymore because by the time we had that conversation, it would have been like less than a year and, and moving there just for like a few months and then like having to figure something else out while signing a lease and all of that is like too much. So I ended up kind of just really benefiting from it. Like I didn't have to uproot my life at all. I, I was able to take on a new position and learn lots and, and meet a lot of new people, even though it was on the other side of the country. And um, it was just kind of opened a whole new world of, of opportunity career wise, which was fantastic. So as far as like having the opportunity to work remote, I think that only really benefits people because you, you also hear a lot of stories about people with like young kids or maybe people who don't want to be commuting two hours every day because of their their situation where they have to live. And for this to be an option for all of those people, I think it brings nothing but but good to the table. And then also, if you're able to work um, for studios in other countries and find a position that you're a bit more into, that that's also a huge plus. So the the only downsides I can see is sometimes like meetings having to be online, even when you're in the studio, is maybe not the most ideal. But that's like such a small price to pay for for the benefits that are coming to a lot of the workers in the industry. Yeah, I'm kind of torn myself. Um, I think I haven't really formulated my thoughts on this whole remote stuff properly. I think it's a huge benefit in all of the scenarios, but I think I think you kind of need a, a core team that's uh, in the office. And I don't mean every day in the office, like hybrid works well, where you can be a couple of days out of the office. But then at the same time, I think you need to have hybrid situation where it's like the whole studio is out of office at this time uh, or sorry, at this day and this day. Uh, but if you need to work from home, whatever day, that's fine. You can, you can go ahead and do that. I think it's just, and I, I speak purely from a having access to people in meetings and iteration quickly. I think being in person is much better for that. Uh, on a personal side, I, I like it because of the social aspect, and I'm, I'm I just I work better when I'm around people. But that's that's irrelevant, really. Um, I think to the final outcome. I think it, it's good for people, like you said, who have children who might want to not be able to move or etc. But I think there's still something special about working in the office. And I think there's we I think we have a long way to go as a as an industry yet to figure out how this is all gonna work. It's definitely not either one way or the other. I think it's gonna be a fine balance between both. Um I think fully remote does work. Um, in, a, in a lot of scenarios, but I think you're making like a very, 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 very large game. Um, perhaps it's a little bit less um, iterative. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, I agree with you because my current position, I, I moved from Toronto to Montreal to be in person, right? Like, I, I think everything you touched on, I would agree with. Like, being in person, it's not needed, but it gives you this kind of energy, this quick iteration process of just like tapping someone on the shoulder or having lunch with people it, it really does go a long way to have that extra connection so i i'm lucky where my studio now does have that hybrid situation and i think in my opinion that is perfect like i i go in person on wednesday and friday and then the rest of the week i i can work from home but just being able to like meet the team in person you definitely click a lot faster like with my previous position where it was only remote I definitely found it a little bit harder to sort of gel with everyone just because you're only really talking to people when it's like a meeting and you don't have as many opportunities to really um, just sort of chill out. Meanwhile, like right now, I can go out for lunch every time I'm, I'm in the office and get to know people and ask them about their weekend and their day. And there's no like screen in the way and people aren't tripping over each other's, you know, like lines and stuff like that. It's it's just so much more natural. And I, I think that's the, the best is, is kind of a middle ground. Make sure to raise your hands on Teams if you yep. don't speak. React with a funny GIF. <laughs> <laughs> Need a meme. For me, I only spent my one job at Naughty Dog in the studio. And then the last day was the first day of the pandemic. So everyone was like, <laughs> kind of like nervous to like high five or hug people who are leaving. Um, so I spent like my last two jobs have been entirely remote. And when I was... Um, and when I was at Sony, uh, like six months in the pandemic, and I was in LA, 
I was like, I don't think I've ever been more miserable in my life because I am very extroverted. So it like just really sucked. So I had to like, I was like bothering them for like a very long time, like a month and a half uh, being like, hey, I don't want to like stay in LA. I want to go home for like two weeks. And then it was, it was like really weird because I remember like it was like there's so many channels like you got to go through because I was a contractor too. But there was, it was like, you, well, Illinois like is covered because I'm from Chicago. And that's like where I wanted to go. And they were like, Illinois is covered like by like tax law, I guess, or something. So I was like, oh. So, because like I'm seeing that like on publicly, I know Insomniac just tweeted it out like or and like posts on their LinkedIn. So does Bungie, like what states, you know, it's proved like work from home. So finally, Sony let me and I like went back to I went back to Chicago and then I was like, I'm not going back to L.A. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was like in the middle of my job because I was saw like my my parents are doctors. So they were like, I, this pandemic is not ending. Like, don't. You know, they just like showed me a bunch of stuff. I'm like, okay, I don't think it's worth it for me to go back to LA. I'm just going to cut my lease and like get everything back here. And like, you know, so like transitioning, you know, it would like just states like in the middle of the job was tough. And it was tough because like I like was like in the same boat where like it's you can't really like inter- you can't interact with anyone except if it's in meetings. And there I wasn't in a lot of meetings. So, uh, you know, it's just kind of lonely. And I really did like miss that connection. You know, that you had just when you go, like, you're in an office, you just kick someone's chair, tell them to go to the kitchen with me so where we can get a snack or we can just go out to lunch or walk out somewhere. Crazy how that's universal, just kicking someone's chair. When they're- <laughs> oh, absolutely. You don't kick people's chairs? <laughs> yeah, <dude. laughs> but like, um, but then I, I started my, um, my new job here. And part of what convinced me was it's a, my team is fully remote. Uh, we're like all over the place. Um, and I was like, oh, wait, but like I'm in Chicago and a lot of people are here. So that could be like my, you know, my fix when everything is like calmed down finally, you know, is um, we can have our work environment, you know, be totally online um, because it'd be, you know, I one thing I don't miss commuting. Like I didn't have to commute that far uh, at Naughty Dog, but if I had had to commute to Insomniac, it would have been probably like an hour commute both ways, like both ways. So that's like two hours a day. And I'm like, that's a whole work day like in a week you now. And like, I don't have like kids or like a pet or like anything, but that's just the idea of just so much of my day being that. And also just, you know, being in an off at the office on a slow day. It's just like, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of, for me, it was, it's like torture. It's, you know, you're just there. And, you know, like, what if you're waiting for like a build, you're literally just sitting there. It's like, at least I can just like get up when I'm at home and like, I don't know, like do my dishes or something for like five minutes or like, when I'm like waiting to hear back from someone and I'm like submitting something to Perforce and it's taking a long time. I don't know. I just, uh, I really like the convenience of it because it gives me overall, it just gives me more time during my day because it's time I'm like, it's basically make sure that like no time is like being wasted, you know, and my sleep schedules become better and my like productivity, like outside of work has become better. Let's talk about that one for a second. Like that's a good one because my sleep schedule was destroyed working from home. I was no longer waking up early whatsoever. There were days where I was like borderline late and I was ending work late and I was going to bed late. And I do that on, on weekends anyway, just because I like to sleep or whatever. But man, I, I did not have any, any like sleep discipline whilst, whilst it was fully work from home. How did you find it? A lot of my coworkers are in Europe. So a lot, our band of meetings is in the morning, usually. I was like that too when I was working with Sony, especially especially when I moved back here because I was two hours ahead of LA. So like I used to start at like 10. Some days like I'd start at noon my time, but you know, 10 their time, I get off at eight. So like I was started. So I like was slowly trans. I was like, well, I, I hate this. So I was slowly like, while I was still there, I was like trying to wake up earlier and earlier so I could get off, you know, earlier, you know, but not like early enough that, you know, like if anyone needed me, cause I'd still be getting off like four their time. And then like over here now, I've gotten up like willingly at like six some days <laughs> at my current job because it's like, well, our meetings are in the morning. So I may as well just, you know, like as long as I'm on, you know, during core hours for the U.S. So it's like, you know, it's nice because and I, I found and I have found like it like it has not impacted my like productivity in the slightest. It's actually only improved it um, like I'm working just a lot faster and better and smarter because like, you know, it's just less stressful. And it's, you know, it's nice too, because like, I always remember when I was at Naughty Dog, 
people would email, you know, like, oh, I got to go to the office, make up time later, you know, and that's very normal at every job. And it's like, oh, I need to, you know, run to the store real quick. I just make up time later, but I don't have to worry about like, you know, commuting off, especially with gas prices right now. It's like, okay, I'll spend an extra 30 minutes, you know. But I, it's so for me, like the convenience is like incredible. And I, I, I personally think that there is, uh, I respect people's decisions, you know, if they don't want to work from home. But I think that any studio that's not at least offering it now is just like, I blows my mind. Like, I don't think there's any yeah. reason to not at least offer the option. It's too competitive to not have some sort of solution for that right now. We're in a bit of a tough spot at the moment trying to hire like a sort of as many strong seniors as we can, but they all like want full remote and we're more of a hybrid kind of situation, right? So we're trying to find solutions for that kind of stuff. And it's been, uh, it's been tough on hiring, I think. I think all around it's been a bit tricky on the hiring at the minute like a lot of studios i think the the something i noticed as a bit of a trend is a lot of studios ended up hiring during the pandemic over the capacity they had yeah because you know if everyone's remote then you're not limited by desk space or you know office capacity and i think generally like a lot of like the trend of games generally being sort of feels like a lot more games are going towards a kind of live service it means you end up supporting games for longer keeping people on projects longer and so it feels like i think it's probably probably an issue that looks as a kind of student or junior looks like a, a problem where it's like ah, oh, all these studios are saying that they're looking for people but there's none of these student jobs which which probably is a bit true really it's like every studio is looking for ideally seniors potentially you know some experienced mids they're not really looking to try and onboard a bunch of juniors because that doesn't necessarily help you that much depending yeah. on where you are in production right like it, if you bringing in three junior people might end up slowing you down where you need to kind of offer them more assistance or you know put one of your seniors on kind of helping supervise them and get them up to speed so and i mean juniors are abundant in, in the industry like there's plenty of them wanting jobs and trying to fill up the higher up positions that's where it's tough because you got to find that person who's just on the, at the right time wanting a job elsewhere or at the right time actually wants to move somewhere else and it's a tough one what is going on with all your appliances this isn't still <laughs> the all right. that was yeah. such comical timing let me <laughs> let me tell you about my dishwasher um let's hear it so i'm ready for this lore. You, you, you'll hear it in the background as it happens anyway so a uh, kitchen's just over there right when the dishwasher's done it beeps like i think seven times very loudly with like a an interval of a couple seconds and then it stops and then you're like ah I, okay, yeah, I'll get the dishes in a second. And then in about 10 minutes, it does it again. And you, get, you go like, crap, I need to go get the dishes. And then uh, you forget about it because you're in the middle of a podcast. In 10 minutes, it does it again. Why? There's no rush to get things out of a dishwasher. <laughs> well, what if it explodes in there? I don't know. It's. I thought my dishwasher was loud, but like at least it only does like three in a row. It's not just like. Oh, no, I'm muted for all the others. For the next 10 years, I will continue beeping. <laughs> it does stop eventually. I just haven't figured out the timing of, of like when it actually stops. I'm sure in like 10 minutes it'll beep again. But also, whoever desi- why, why do dishwashers even need to shout at you loudly? Just, it's, just like, it's a new thing. It's real, I, life, I it's, it's real life environmental storytelling. It exactly. Is. I got a, a dryer here that like plays a full song for you. A song and dance every time it's finished. It's just like, I'll just be like doing work and in the background. I hear like a, it's like 30 seconds long. And I'm really? just like, okay, this is, I mean, it's chill, but it's like, I don't think this is necessary. <laughs> You're just in the, in the middle of a meeting or a podcast and you hear this uh, huge dance and song behind you. I wonder what that some, is. Some robo beeps and boops. <laughs> Absolutely wild. Anyway, that's the, that's the story of my dishwasher. I know it's super entertaining, but yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Crazy dishwasher. Um, so something that Charlie touched on being on a contract when you were with Sony. I think there's definitely, from anyone on the outside or maybe even just the start of your career, it's not very clear what the difference between a contract and a full-time role is. Um, this also might differ across countries. Obviously, we have kind of a UK experience, but you guys might might have different experience with this. But it'd be good to hear a little bit about what are the differences that you guys have seen between getting kind of contract roles or full-time roles, what that actually means? Uh, for me, it's mainly anxiety before anything, before anything like else that's like practical. The different, because this is my first full-time role that I have right now, just the 
idea that like my job doesn't have a set, you know, end date definitely like makes me, you know, like not worry as much and lets me like focus more on like what I'm doing. Cause I have seen it before, you know, kind of will dangle like full time, like over like studios will dangle like full time, like over people's heads to make them work like a lot of hours. Cause it's like, Oh, you know, if you, if you crunch really hard, we'll give you, you know, a full time job. And then at the end of their contract, they're like SOL, you know, for some reason that I quite don't understand because I don't know everything. But I I think I've personally like seen like I think contract is just a way that I get like why it's done. But more often than not, I see it as a way for studios to take advantage of usually younger game devs. I really dislike it. And I think like I have seen like senior contract roles. And I think that's like kind of crazy. Because it's like at that point, you're basically like, you know, like most of the more often than not, like not paying benefits to someone who's very clearly qualified for a higher uh, level role. The senior roles, you know, are a lot, you know, usually it means you're like completely like self-reliant. They don't even have to like train you essentially like or you'll basically, you know, like read the documentation and stuff. You're like pretty much entirely self-sufficient as a senior. At least that's, you know, what job description is most of the time. So I just think that that's like a crazy thing. I also, my, my previous position was contract, and I can relate to pretty much all of that. Like, I, I Ubisoft was full-time, and then I, I left to do a contract position at the Coalition. And, like, my entire experience there was amazing. The only thing that I wouldn't have liked was the contract, but that was, like, that, that's no fault of theirs. That's universal across across all studios. But I think as long as you know what you're getting into if you're in that position, because... Like there are definitely some downsides, but the the work is more or less the same. You're still talking with the team. It's just yeah, this idea looming over you the whole time, where it's like you have to find a job at some point. Like can't stay here forever. Um, for me, at least, it was very clear that like they they pretty much don't hire on anyone after contract. So I I always knew that I would have to look for something at some point, which is not super comfortable. Like when you're coming up on your last few months, you're really starting to like eagle eye all over the place. Um, even my my partner, she's working on a, a contract position right now, and we've talked like, oh, come November, we're gonna have to find something else. Um, so it's like these things are always in your mind, like you're always thinking about it. It is kind of cool to maybe try some new things, and and I don't know. I mean, maybe if you worked at a place for only a year and you left, that doesn't look too good on your resume, but it's it's not as bad when it's contract. It's like the only upside I can really think of if you really want to just try out a, a bunch of new stuff. But the thing that I I thought was like i don't know some of it is kind of scummy this is like a i think it's a across canada thing for contract i'm not sure about the details but the one thing that i, I hated about it the most was the time off because we didn't really have time off like there was no benefits in general really but time off was like the big one so we had i think it was 10 working days that i could have off across my year and a half of this contract but the way that they do it here in canada is they take that 10 days off worth of payment and they divvy it up and pay it across your um, checks as if it's like an additional little bonus every single time you get paid. And that's like it equals to 10 days off on top of what you're paid. But you get used to it really quickly. So you get like your first check in the mail or whatever sent to you and you're used to like getting this much a week or this much biweekly. And it really disincentivizes you from taking any time off because you don't still get that in your your payment. It's just like you take a day off, you lose 20% of your payment for that week. And I, I never wanted to take any time off because I was used to a certain amount coming in. And I was like, okay, well, if I take a week off, I just straight up do not get paid for this week, even though technically at the end of the day is all the same. But it's just little things like that where it's a bit more like we just want you to do work rather than like, oh, yeah, go take some time off and you're part of the team and all of that. So it's little things here and there that, that make it a bit different. That's a tough one. I'm... I'm personally, I'm fairly anti-contract. I think it's uh, very exploitative, and I think I understand why it happens. Like you're you're now entering production, you just need to to get everything done, hire as many people as you can, let go of them at the end, so that you can just downsize the team back to whatever. But um, it's it's tough. I I think it's a fairly um, it happens more in America. I think contracts uh than it does in the UK. But I've seen my fair share here, and I think. If they could just disappear and we could just have a full full time team at all times, that would be much better. CIG was very much full time and it was great. Being a warm body is the worst experience I've ever had in mm. the industry. Like 
just to like when you mentioned like to fill up you know like you're getting to the end of production like there's like nothing that's ever made me feel like more worthless like at my job which is like a huge reason now i'm like super uh like if any like whenever now like anyone messages me on linkedin about a contract i immediately say no and i say absolutely not uh, and i've i've gotten progressively more annoyed with it the more i more people message me about it because as people are asking me i'm getting later into my career and i'm like i'm like you know even i know what i'm worth now and i'm like not worth that so i i don't know i just find it like insulting now at this point more than <laughs> it's like it's crazy like how quick like the mindset like changed on it because i've only done this for three years so i'm not like you know it's not like in you know i think it's a lot of people like would let the ego like get in the way but it's like you know once you have felt how it feels you know to be in that position you never mm -hmm. ever want to feel it again because it sucks a lot Ooh. so i like broke into your point <laughs> that, that's fair that's uh, the conversation we want to hear it's definitely a tricky area right like understand from a company perspective that hiring everyone full-time is is tricky and contract does offer a bit of flexibility smaller studios also maybe don't want to uh, you know ramp up their team so much but they need they do need to bring in some people who know uh, who have skills or abilities perhaps outside of what they they have available but it does almost feel like it's bigger places that tend to use it more even just kind of bring people in and, and churn through and and there is certainly that feeling of not being as included in the team when you're on that contract it often means as well that you don't get the same perks as someone full-time situations where like the team will be celebrating some sort of bonus they have like some large bonus and the contractors are there like yeah great we don't get them fantastic good for you yeah, and it's a lot usually like a lot a lot it's definitely yeah it is definitely tricky the only time that i guess working more on contracts could be beneficial is if you are at a point in your career where you're able to do more of like smaller freelance stuff where it's like you can take on maybe a couple of projects simultaneously and you're at the point where you have the kind of speed and ability to churn stuff out and you can be more choosy over what you do and you're not so tied down. And that ties into the previous point as well of like if you can be remote because if you can be remote and if you want to do some quick freelance stuff, contracts are great. Assuming that the company uh, offers you that. But a lot of companies offer you contracts and say, cool, move here for six months. And you're like, well, no, that's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Finding a six month lease is honestly harder than actually like getting to the place. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Thinking about my last position where I was in the headspace of like, yeah, I'm going to move all the way across the country for a contract. Now I'm like, I don't know if that was such a good idea. <laughs> I don't think I would ever do that. I, I'm in the, definitely in the same camp of like full time for sure. I think I, I didn't appreciate it as much in my first gig at Ubisoft until I, I did end up at that contract position. It was pretty eye opening. I, I still wouldn't have changed anything. Like I think the the decisions I made all ended up working out. But I, I definitely appreciate the full time a lot more now. If that's something you can go for, absolutely do it. Yeah, it's it might be better for like rapidly learning. But at some point, like it's only so sustainable to be just like jumping from place to place for so long. And I know a lot of people like Charlie, we have some mutual friends who are always taking on contracts and maybe more than they probably should. And I, I think I've been guilty of that in the past, but uh, uh, I was about to say, are you sure you're not talking about yourself? <laughs> maybe, maybe sometimes, but uh, eventually you're like, okay, I, I need like a, a rock to kind of lean back on. And not, not in the sense that like you should get too comfortable and you should be learning or anything like that. You can only sustain the anxiety of like, what's next? What's next? So long before you're like, I just want to really sink my teeth into something like I'm really I'm really loving the project I'm on now like I feel like I'm actually able to make a difference and knowing that I'm going to be there when it ships is is a great feeling because the the previous title I was on like I was really enjoying it but it is a little sad to like in the back of your mind you're always like well I'm never going to see this through I'm never going to be there with the tea but it like ships and all of that and it, it kind of you want to have like a mental disconnect to sort of like put up a barrier so you're not like too phased by it when it eventually happens so i just think it's it's overall like a healthier mindset where i am now where i'm like yeah i'm, I'm enjoying this team and it makes me want to work there long term and, and really see things through yeah i agree with that it's like a, yeah because even i wasn't there for like the last like two three months uh like before last was like two actually shipped and then we just had a very awkward zoom call with like everyone like i get it was during the pandemic so there was never like a launch like party but that was like 
once you're like out the door, it's like, all right, well, that's that. Hooray. <laughs> oh, like it's over now. So um, anticlimactic, right? I mean, I, I definitely think the pandemic is part of that. I was just going to say, I can't wait to be there when like a game actually ships because I've never been at the studio when something like that happens because or even when like our game has been properly announced because when I was at UB Toronto the pandemic started when we announced Far Cry 6 so we weren't really there for that and then I left before it shipped and then when I was working on Gears people were definitely like it was like the last two DLC packs so it definitely seemed like people were ready to move on to the next thing there is no big celebration with like the final map for coming out because people are like we've already done 20 of these and then now I have an opportunity to to be here when everything's being announced and and comes out so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that I think like that ties right back to the team morale and like being there in person but it it, it really helps it makes you want to do even better I think we've uh we covered some pretty pretty good stuff so i'm gonna grab a patreon question we'll wrap up with with answering that so i've got a question here asking about elitism so saying that perhaps it's it's more visible online i'm going to extrapolate and say this probably refers to twitter because that seems to be where if ever i hear about people being elitist it's on twitter have you guys ever had kind of any experience with that of of um, elitism sort of in the industry or what, perhaps back when you were a student and how you kind of deal with that or how you think people should be dealing with that? Dylan, do you want to go first? Because I definitely have some stuff. I'm trying to think of some examples. So I'm like, maybe I, I have, for some reason, I'm drawing a blank as to like, can I have like an example of what someone might do that would fall into that category? Um, what I could think of, if someone like speaking objectively like if someone like basically like when someone makes like you know like a thread one out of 20 uh and it's basically you know like talking <laughs> about like something to you know something <laughs> in the industry <laughs> i've definitely made threads like that but for video games that i'm playing <laughs> but like when someone like you know like posts like a long thing about how people should and like you know shouldn't act or what they should and shouldn't have in a portfolio for like you can give someone like all the advice. Like I knew this guy when I was in college who was really good, but could not find a job. And his attitude was amazing. Like legitimately this guy in like a second, I'd work with this guy in like a second. And like, he would like look at those like one to 20 threads, you know, of like advice and like, I'm doing all of that. And like, he's networking and like, just at the end of the day, like getting like a job is like, just like luck based, you know, it's just like, so at the end, like people, I feel like on, Twitter, especially like I've really, really stepped back from Twitter, especially like in the last like two, two and a half years, because like now I basically only use it to like talk about Fire Emblem or what. <laughs> That's all I do with my life. Uh, but like I, I think like social media is like almost like a fake power trip for like people. Yeah. Uh, like essentially, <laughs> it's it's like a you know you you have like a lot of followers and you see like that your posts like you know have reach and they're reaching a lot of people in the community. And like, you know, slowly, like, I don't, I think most people are like, not even aware of it. Like they start to like, realize like the kind of power, like their words have, and you start to feel like you're helping a lot of people. It can like come off as arrogant, you know, I think I like, I like to think better of people that like, they don't realize it comes off that way. Cause I definitely think I was like, almost going to be like in this boat, like when I, when I started like in the industry, but I think like with everything like that was going on. Uh, like after I think it like humbled me and made me realize like social media is like really dangerous because when, when I've given talks at my alma mater uh, like about how to get into the industry I always give them this one slide that I have pre-made that shows like every social media that I used like when I was getting into the industry and then I have a slide after that says okay once you get in you should delete all of these except for like arts <laughs> <laughs> because they're good for getting in and then when you're in they are worthless traps and like opinion cesspools and you should like get off of them sorry to interject like it's also a trap in a different scenario where you've got all these innocent devs who've got their jobs at whatever sony working on last of us part six and uh then you got the the fans who have come in and be like oh yeah tell us more haha you know this sucks or that sucks and they start to interact and you know <laughs> yes oh my god that was exactly what i was gonna say right that was exactly what i was gonna say 
so I see a lot of devs engaging with like with so many people, and I'm like, you, Charlie, you saw. I think it was our friend Chunk posted it in the chat. But when I when I left the coalition and I went to move to Compulsion, they're both Microsoft Studios. There was like people writing articles and like, oh my god, I remember that. that we're getting like. They were getting like hundreds of retweets being like, Coalition Dev, Dylan Abernathy leaves to work at other studio. And I was like, what the hell? How am I supposed to respond to this? <laughs> there's a, there's like news articles you can read about like the initiative about Perfect Dark's dev. And in every article at the end, they show the entire dev team because people just scoured like LinkedIn to see like air. And I was like, holy crap, <laughs> that's like crazy. It's it's so weird. I, I was like so uncomfortable. I'm just like, should I be like trying to like push this down? I didn't do anything wrong, but I, like people were trying to like make stories about like the coalition's going under. I'm like, no, it's very normal. <laughs> we're both at Microsoft yeah. Studios, and my contract was up. So yeah. I don't know. Um, I I can think of a, an example of elitism though that I I came across. This was a Discord that I was in. I don't want to say which Discord. I think I know, but I feel like it's probably better if I don't say it. But there was this person who posted like a, a render of like, a, I think it was a coffin or something. And then they went on this big spiel about how they're going to stop working on their portfolio because the only people who get jobs in the industry now are like pretty girls and stuff. And his work was like not good at all. He's like, I, I never get past the interviews. People were destroying this guy on Twitter. But it was just like his stuff wasn't that good and he was just looking for a scapegoat and it's like no that was um it was an art station challenge i remember that oh was it okay yeah, it was an art station challenge and they linked it for facebook i remember i that. believe these are actually different instances i believe the coffin guy was on discord because okay saw that. i thought so oh, man. But it was just like the at the end of the day if it's like you if you're the common denominator always not getting what you want it's probably your fault um, you should knock your, your ego down a peg a little bit. Um, like even people who've been working in the industry for 20 years have like, tons of things that they could be improving on constantly. It's like if you've never had a job, um, there, there's like infinite room to grow. So don't look for like a group of people or a, a studio or anything to, to blame. That's it's, the best part of this industry is that we're always growing. Yeah. The game industry is like one of the, the game industry is like factually probably the fastest growing tech industry like it's only been around for like what like 40 47 years or something uh i don't remember like when the arcade sticks like came out but like it's for how young it is because cinema has been around for even longer and the game industry has like already like evolved leaps and bounds since you know since super mario brothers like stuff i'm just like picking an old game like at random so you know now we've got uh the fur we've got like the individual fabrics on mario's clothes being rendered you know <laughs> It's like they, you gotta like you know i remember having that conversation with a friend um at sony who was like trying to give feedback to a senior and the senior was not having it and because like he was a junior so and it's like dude like you know things have changed you know you gotta like just be accepted i think that's like part of honestly like we said this at the beginning of the podcast i remember um like about uh how art skills you know will come with time I would much rather hire someone whose skills are like 70% if they were 110% to work with because skill like will come like, uh, mm -hmm. it, like, like it's kind of why I just like as a side tangent, um, I don't like believe in talent personally, uh, because like everyone starts like somewhere. It's just that people grow at different, you know, rates. That's just how it is. And I feel, I feel personally like that saying someone is like, talented takes away from the hard work that they spent to get you know to that point um like obviously i'll say it's like oh you're so talented uh with like the acknowledgement you know that someone worked really hard you know to get that good because we all like don't know anything at the beginning still don't yeah exactly yeah we're all there the kind of semi spicy take that i have here is that game art actually doesn't matter that much and you don't have to be the 100 percent best of what you do if you are fantastic to work with like i i definitely I agree. would rather work with someone who's like 10 out of 10 person 6 out of 10 artist rather than the 10 out of 10 artist who's a pile of human garbage i like to i like to say that we're making fucking video games 
Like that's what I say. Yeah. Right? <laughs> like, dude, what the hell? I've said that, ironically, I've said I've said that about like like to myself, like pretty much about like anyone that's like getting mad at like gamers telling them that like their game is trash. Like, who cares, man? You make cool art. If you're like happy, like I don't care. Like a lot of people hated Last of Us too. Uh, I don't like it either. I, <laughs> but it's like it's not my problem. Like what other people think of it, you know? It's like you know, it's my job. I went in, I got like it advanced my career, and then I move on to the next one. And it's like, oh, I like Spider Man, and now I really like the project I'm on now. And like you know, I don't you're care not what allowed to like your project. They're all business. Don't all business. <laughs> I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. I think a lot of you don't even have to like the game you're working on. Like the number of people I've worked with who I don't really play the game I work on. I know a lot of people who don't really play the games they work on. Like it doesn't matter. Right? Like if you enjoy the the art and uh you know you can do what needs to be done, it's it's a job, right? It's like who it doesn't really matter. It's in a way it's probably like a detriment if you're too attached to it, right? Like you're gonna become it's gonna be harder to be objective if you're you know you're super passionate about the game and you're super trying to force through all of your ideas it's going to be more difficult and sometimes you need to to step back a little bit and be a bit detached from the stuff you're working on so you can be like yeah you know actually that we could do this would be better or i think you've even got the people who don't even play video games and they're there just like making them so like that though that one is a little strange I've never played a video game in my life, honestly. What are what are video games? I'm sure I heard a story of someone who like they had a concept artist at their studio who just like thought games were just for nerds and would just leave on Friday and be like, "Later, nerds." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I say that, but that's just because because I'm memeing. <laughs> oh, I just like I like the idea. I, I I've heard it in like other departments and stuff, like uh, writing teams on games and stuff. Where like, well, yeah, I'm the writer on this project, but I don't play games. It helps to have a bit of a passion generally for games because the industry is not, without using the word exploitative, I would say there are, you, you could be making more money doing easier things if that was what you really cared about. Like if you're not actually passionate about working on games. Like, like crypto. Yeah, go make NFTs. No, but like, <laughs> oh no, I've gotten, <laughs> I've gotten DMs about people being like, yeah, make this. And it's, it's, it's always like the most unprofessional not thought through like plans ever yeah i got my first nft email finally oh, yeah? the other congratulations day. i'm part of the club baby <laughs> i got a, i got a linkedin nft invite yesterday and the guy had like you know when like on linkedin where someone has in their title like 10 things separated yeah they were just CEO. every everyone like i need to learn you'd love it i need to show you like the image it was like metaverse nft it just kept getting worse as you go along i was like Everything you stand for, I hate. I think that uh, that ship has sailed. I, I don't think there's really any reason to get into it now if you weren't before. Um, nah. I, I hey, this know. is a whole other ten hour podcast, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but on the on the note of ten hour podcast, I think we're probably at a good point to to ask my special question, which does mean Brian gets his bonus question. That's right. You've both been to Canada. So I I you know what I'm going to ask? <laughs> yes. Um, something not, not at all to do with Canada. Flavored water, yes or no? I think flavored water is good, and that has nothing to do with Canada. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll say this. I recently moved to Montreal, which is very, very French. And I guess yeah, the French Montreal. people, yes, they love their sparkling water with flavor. And I, I finally get it. That's my go-to drink at work now. I think it's okay <laughs> if it's sparkling, but if it's still water with flavor, hmm. big trouble. No. no, it's either classic or really bougie. No, no in between for me. And then extra bonus question because it's always good to hear this from our guests. What is your favorite food? Oh, uh, I'm gonna have to put you on the spot here. Uh, can I? Can I answer two? You can answer two because all food is sacred. So okay, I'm gonna have to go with uh, shawarma and ramen. Mm. Great, great. Question. I never knew you were a shawarma guy, Dylan. Man, shawarma. Is, is how can you say no to a shawarma? No, I love shawarma. <laughs> Mine's a sushi or pizza because I'm boring. Nah, man, that's good. <laughs> Dude, that's good. It's a fantastic sushi, fantastic. What do you mean? Good. There, there you go, Tim. It has been done. Lovely. We've done it. All right. Well, thank you everyone for for listening in and making it through another another podcast with us. 
Uh, thanks to our fantastic guests, Charlie and Dylan, for being with us and uh, answering all our questions. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks, I love talking. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. And thanks for Luan for, for being here and doing no his thing. Worries. If you guys want to get some more EXP goodness, come join us on Discord, talk about things, come check out the website, new articles weekly, um, or, or have a check out of the uh, mentorships that EXP have running now. Um, great way to to get some bespoke learning in. Yeah, until next time, everyone. Uh, take care, and we'll catch you later. Bye. Bye.